In this video, I'm going to be going over some basic terminology that you need to be aware of when you are thinking about your diet and following the guidelines given out by the US government in order to maintain a healthy diet. One of the terms you need to be aware of is the dietary reference intakes or the DRIs. These are categories of nutrient need recommendations that are, uh, that are meant to maintain proper health and physiological function. This is not based on um, special conditions, so special clinical conditions, or um, maybe special conditions related to exercise um, that are, or something like that, where somebody might need a little more of a nutrient than somebody else. So these are meant for, for basic health-based uh, recommendations here. All right, so the first uh, category of a DRI is called the Estimated Average Requirement, or the EAR, and this is the uh, level of need of some, whatever nutrient you're talking about. It's the level of need that would satisfy 50% of the population. So the bottom half of the population uh, for that nutrient. So if we look at this uh, sort of normally distributed curve here for those who've had their stats, um, this is a normal bell-shaped curve, which most biological um, uh, mechanisms within the body follow a bell-shaped curve like this. All right, so we have the um, the amount of need going from low need to high need, and then averages in the middle. And we have the percentage of the population that falls on that. So very few people have a low need for any nutrient that you're talking about. Very few people have a high need. Most people are somewhere in the middle, as you can see by this sort of, again, the bell shape to this curve. So the EAR, it falls directly on this, this 50 percentile line, this average line right in the middle. This is the EAR. So everything below, so if somebody ate the EAR, the, they would have about a 50% chance of being, have their health satisfied by that amount of nutrient that they took in. This is obviously not enough for a lot of people. So this is not what we use uh, when we are giving recommendations out or when the, the government gives a recommendation out. The recommended daily allowance, the RDA, is the type of dietary reference intake that the government wants to recommend and typically does when there's a, a high amount of evidence and they can uh, specifically say what people need. All right, so if they can make an, an EAR, so an estimated average requirement, they can make a recommended daily uh, allowance. Um, and so, what the RDA is, is how much intake would be necessary to satisfy 97.5% of healthy people. So almost everybody. So right here at the end of this blue area where it goes white, that is 97.5% uh, of the people. So nine, from here down would be that 97.5%. So most people, if they followed the RDA, they would get what they need. Only about two and a half percent or so of people uh, would not get what they need by following the RDA. I mentioned if we have an EAR, we can get an RDA. The reason for this is the RDA is calculated as the EAR plus two standard deviations. So it's the average plus two standard deviations away, giving you that 97 and a half or so percent of the people who would be satisfied by the RDA. All right, so unlike the RDA where I have this green light for the adequate intake or the AI, I have a yellow light. And I have that for a reason. It's because an AI or an adequate intake is a lot like an RDA, but it's not as good. And the reason it's not as good is because we don't have enough evidence. We don't have enough agreement amongst the experts in the field or the, the need for individuals is much more varied. Uh, and so it makes it very hard to have these very strict statistical cut points that we need in order to develop an RDA from the EAR. All right. So the adequate intake then is the recommendation that the government gives. So the U.S. government gives whenever um, we don't have sufficient evidence to give a, a better recommendation. And so an example of a, a, a nutrient we actually need a lot of, um, it's the nutrient we need the most of actually, um, that has an adequate intake is water. We don't have an RDA for water, it's an adequate intake. All right, so going on from there, um, we have two other categories. We have the chronic disease uh, reduction intake or the CDRR. And we have the tolerable upper intake level, the UL. Both these I have red lights here. 
um, because these are values that you typically don't want to go above. So the chronic disease reduction intake level is a level that if you go above it, um, you probably won't have immediate problems, but if, you're, if you go above it and you stay above it, you're likely to develop some sort of chronic condition later on. For instance, with sodium, if you go above um, the CDRR, you're likely to, uh, you're more likely to develop things like hypertension later on. It's not probably going to happen right away, but later on it might. Um, the tolerable upper intake level is um, a little more important one really to try to avoid because this is the one where you can develop toxicity to the, the nutrient by going above this. So if you're going above the upper limits or the tolerable upper, upper intake limit or level for a nutrient, you're likely to develop some issues in the much more short term than what you do would with this chronic disease category. So both of these, though, are categories you typically don't want to go above. Much of the uh, information I'm giving you in this uh, this video, as well as in this sort of whole lecture series, is coming from the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, the 2020 to 2025 uh, edition. Um, so they redo this about every five years. And they have recommendations for various age categories, but I'm going to be focused on the adult category, so uh, 19 years of age and above. And so the macronutrient recommendations uh, for people 19 and above are 45 to 65% of their calories come from carbohydrates, 20 to 35% of their calories coming from fats, 10 to 35% of their calories coming from protein. And keep in mind, most Americans are over consuming protein. So most people can eat way more protein than they should. And so this sort of trend for uh, recommending eating these very high protein diets is probably not necessarily uh, something we should be doing. Some general dietary advice coming from that same source is to choose foods that are going to limit your saturated fats to less than 10% of your total calories your added sugars to also less than 10% of your total calories, uh, your sodium to be less than 2,300 milligrams of total calories. Keep in mind, this is actually gonna be lower for people with some chronic conditions like hypertension, where instead of 2,300 being the uh, what you wanna be below, it's probably more like 1,500 that you should stay below. Uh, and then the last one on this list though is uh, alcohol. Uh, that should be less than uh, or equal to two drinks per day for men, and less than or equal to one drink per day for women. That is if you drink it at all. In reality, um, they just have this on here to try to guide people who do drink alcohol on a regular basis, but it's probably best that you just don't drink alcohol on a regular basis. That would be better than having this the two drinks or one drink per day. And they also recommend having a varied diet where you eat micronutrient dense foods. So you don't want to eat a bunch of foods that don't have uh, vitamins and minerals in them, basically. And talking about how many calories should come from various macronutrients, we need to talk about um, the daily value and quickly look at a nutritional label. All right, so the daily value is the, um, the amount of calories that is uh, shown on all of the um, nutrient facts on various foods that you buy in the United States. So they're all based on a 2,000 kilocalorie per day diet. Um, now, not everybody needs 2,000 calories per day, or kilocalories, calories, same thing in this context. Um, some people need more, some people need less. But again, these, these labels are always based on the daily value of 2,000 calories per day. And so when you look at the percentages of uh, the calories that, that you're consuming in this food, whatever this food might be, you know, here it says you have total fats as one gram, it's 1% 1 of your total recommendation for the day. That's based on a 2000 calorie diet, not specifically to your or whoever you're working with calorie, the number of calories they should be consuming. So how do you know how many calories that you or someone you're working with should be consuming then? There are various ways to do this. Um, some of the better ones would be to do some actual measurements. All right, so a couple things, a couple terms you need to be aware of. So the resting metabolic rate is how much energy we need when we are just at rest. So you can see here an example of someone having their resting metabolic rate measured. So they have this sort of plastic hood over their head. All the air coming out of their body is being uh, 
uh, travel is traveling through this tube, going to this metabolic cart where it's being measured to, for how much O2 is being consumed by the body and how much CO2 is being made by the body. And so this would be how you could actually measure someone's resting metabolic rate. It's also how you would measure someone's basal metabolic rate. Basal metabolic rate is very similar to your resting metabolic rate, but with some very standardized and strict criterion for determining are they truly at rest. All right, so some of those things are going to be, are they you know, lying supine, like here, the person lying on their back, in a dimly lit thermoneutral room, so not basically you know, around 70 degrees Fahrenheit for the room. Um, immediately after sleep, about 12 hours or greater from their last meal, no physical activity also for 12 hours or greater too. So those are some standard criterion for a basal metabolic rate measurement. Um, there are others that you might find out there in various literature as well. The basal metabolic rate, again, very similar to a resting metabolic rate, just more standardized is 60 to 75% of your total energy expenditure for most people. Um, the remainder of that being pretty much uh, your activities that you do during the day, uh, whether it being physical activities, exercise, uh, or just daily activities, you know, going up your steps or you know, walking across your house or something like that. All right, so your basal metabolic rate is going to vary uh, based on uh, some you know, fairly common characteristics. So it's lower in women than it is in men. It declines with uh, with age. So as you get older, it goes down. And it's also related to how much fat-free mass you have. So if you have basically muscle mass, so if you have more muscle mass, you're gonna have a higher basal metabolic rate than somebody with less muscle mass. Um, if you do caloric restriction, so dieting and fasting, that is also going to lower your basal metabolic rate. And so, um, for if you're trying to, if you're someone who's trying to lose weight, exercise with your dieting is going to be better for maintaining basal metabolic rate because the exercise uh, forces your body to sort of keep metabolism up in order to. Um, keep the, the metabolic processes needed for the exercise happening and to uh, you know, keep normal physiological function. So if you do diet and exercise, it's better than either one alone for weight loss. Going beyond just the resting and basal metabolic rates, what you're really after though is your total metabolic rate. Um, your total metabolic rate is the the what you do at rest um, but also now adding in your activities you do during the day so if you know your um, basal metabolic rate and your activities of daily living and your exercises uh, your exercise and all of those things together how much they how much energy they require that is the total metabolic rate and that's actually the, um, if you have that in calories, that's how many calories you need to consume in order to maintain your body mass. If you eat less, you lose weight. If you eat more, you gain weight. Measuring this is the best, but you can also do this through estimations. Um, so there are various estimate-based equations. There's the Harris-Benedict equation. There is the um, Nifflin St. Jory equation as well. And I will put links below this video uh, in the description to videos I already have showing how to use those equations.